From beach towels to tea towels, and from mugs to water bottles, the TNT Shop has it all. Browse our shop now at tntradio.live. This is the Patrick Henningsen Show on TNT Radio. And welcome to the Patrick Henningsen Show with me, Basil Valentine. In for Patrick today, Tuesday the 27th of February 2024. And I'm delighted to say that we have once again a highly informative and entertaining program for you. Later in this hour, I will be joined by the former Liberal Democrat MP, who I discovered when perusing his biography this afternoon, was instrumental earlier this century in the Northern Ireland Peace Accords. I'm talking, of course, about one of TNT's latest hosts, the one and only Lembit Opic. Very much looking forward to talking to Lembit about the parlous, absolutely dreadful state of British politics with the vast majority of the UK electorate saying basically a plague on both your houses. They want nothing to do with either Labour or the Conservatives. And who can blame them? Uh, I'm reminded of the former boxer former world welterweight champion Terry Marsh. Uh, we should get him as, an, as a guest sometime because Terry legally changed his name to X None of the Above. X None of the Above. So that he can stand for Parliament and uh, with the initial X, he's likely to be the last person uh, on the ballot paper. He's likely to be, in most cases, at the bottom of the ballot paper. And therefore, the opportunity is to vote for none of the so-called serious candidates above him on the list. Formerly Terry Marsh, now X, none of the above. So we'll have to get Terry on. Um, uh, Lembit, I think, is uh, in broad agreement. We'll find out the strength of his allegiance to the Liberal Democrats these days. I think he's brought in broad agreement that uh, we have a form of representative democracy, so-called representative democracy, that quite simply doesn't represent the people anymore, if indeed it ever did. The gloves are off, the oligarchy, the naked plutocracy is there for all to see, not least over the question of the massacres, genocide in the Middle East, which continue apace and which scandalously the United Kingdom House of Commons has not even had a chance to vote to end since November. How many thousands have died and been mutilated since then? So Lemby will be joining me later in the programme and then in the second hour, I will be joined by our trusted economics and cryptocurrency expert, the one and only Mr. Blake Lovewell. But before all that, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by somebody who is now quite a regular TNT contributor, but his first appearance on The Patrick Henningsen Show, the off-guardian, self-described accidental journalist, Mr. Kit Knightley. Welcome to the programme, Kit. To be here. It's great that you can join us. Um, so, first of all, very quickly, you describe yourself as an accidental journalist. I mean, to some extent, that might apply to me as well. I've been uh, sort of driven into this line of work to some extent by the egregious situation of our media, politics, and the generally appalling level of debate. So, I'm doing my little bit, really, to uh, stick my oar in, have my tapney worth or whatever, and to try and say some things that I need, think need saying and platform some people like your good self who need platforming. Are you on the same sort of page, kid? Exactly. You, you couldn't have described it better. I, I didn't ever plan to be a journalist. I didn't train to be a journalist. I just saw a gap that needed, needed input. Um, there are things that needed to be said and nobody was saying them. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, you write very largely, I think, for Off Guardian, which I've been a fan of for years, and I, which basically sort of... Go on. 
I, I edit off Guardian. Off Guardian. You edit it's, off Guardian. Th yeah. Thank you for correcting me. Which, uh, apart from anything else, um, I've all sort of always understood to be uh, the articles that the Guardian should print or might have printed 50 years ago, but doesn't print anymore. Not now that it's an organ of the UK national security state. Well, very much. I mean, the reason it's called Off Guardian is that, um, and the story is kind of apocryphal now, but if it, everybody that started up out of Guardian were people who were banned from the comment section on the Guardian website um, back right. in 2014 or 15. I didn't know that. Okay. And uh, your most recent piece deals with some really draconian legislation. I don't know if it's... Uh, already been rubber stamped by the uh, Elysee or, or whatever in France. Um, Freddie Ponton referred to this as well. Uh, it sounds like you're going to fall foul of the law for expressing opinions. It seems that the French want to roll back the Liberté, Égalité and Fraternité of the revolution and instead are sort of reverting to the absolutist rule of the 18th century uh, but in a new of course highly technocratic and even more disastrous form can you enlighten us kid as to exactly what's happening in france well they've um they've just passed through a collection of of new articles to various standing laws but we'll call it a law for the sake of argument um de uh, detailing the struggle against sectarian abuses is how they're putting it which creates several new criminal offences um, to place people, to place or maintain people in a uh, position of psychological stress and, and with that to imbue, induce them to do what you will. Basically, it's, it's um, the actual language is deliberately vague uh, throughout. It's vague throughout. You can't nail down anything because that's the nature of laws in the 21st century, unfortunately. Um, there's a section dealing with health, which basically will make it illegal to persuade people to stop taking medicines or to persuade people to take medicines that the state says they shouldn't take. So that targets largely or will target largely alternative medicine practitioners who say, don't take those pills, take these vitamins and stuff like that. Um, it creates something called the anti-sectarian -sect anti mission which is like a board that will review anonymous testimony from victims of sects um, and will then act on that testimony. But they will never get to know the names of these victims or exactly what they say, because it's all going to be anonymized. And of course, the big problem here is that a sect doesn't have a legal definition. So a sect could be anything, just a, any group of people who share beliefs or practices could be considered a sect. Like, uh, like I, I said in my article about it, it's a it's a vague law, and a vague law is always trouble. We're finding the same thing in the United Kingdom. I was talking yesterday to your namesake at Clarenberg about the so-called National Security Act, whereby you can fall foul of the law and indeed uh, be accused, found guilty, and sentenced for material benefit from a foreign adversary simply for looking at a post on social media. Uh, it's as bad as that. Um, it seems almost deliberate that laws, and is it coincidental? We have to ask ourselves, Kit, on both sides of the channel, are so opaque, so badly worded. Same thing's happening in Ireland, this word harm, um, you know, stress, as you yeah. said, these are completely undefined. Likewise, uh, you know, extremist, extreme, not defined in any way, shape or form. But for me, the real extremists is the authoritarian so-called centre, because mm. ironically, it's centrists like Macron that bring in legislation that is essentially fascist, but is seeking to portray others, dissidents, in other words, uh, as fascists. It's all completely topsy-turvy. Yeah. I mean, it's 
There's it. You can add other lists, other words to that list of words that have been read like totally vague in law. Like there's a, an English law that says like, I think it's the hate speech law. It uh, can, like behaves in a manner likely to cause offense, which doesn't mean anything. Um, and you're completely right. It is definitely coordinated. It's a, a response to how COVID as a narrative in 2020 failed, in my view. Like they stayed they did it, they saw where it didn't work, and they are addressing those failures through legislation, be it internationally via the Pandemic Act that empowers the WHO to do more, or on a nation-by-nation -nation basis. Um, most specifically, I think, this, the failure was in control of the story. So what they're really targeting, and they are targeting for all sorts of different reasons, be it hate speech or equality, whatever they want to call it, um, internet publishing in various ways, via social media or via your own websites. All of these laws address that a little bit. Even this, this French law that just passed has much stricter punishments for people publishing health advice on the internet than giving it in person, which I think is very interesting. Yeah, and well, you have to ask yourself why they would do that. I mean, obviously, the internet has greater reach. So perhaps the theory behind it is that you can do more harm to more people if you publish. But, you know, surely we live in a world where each of us takes responsibility for our own actions. We don't have to read health advice. We don't have to take health advice. Um, you know, the free exchange of ideas, whether relating to health or anything else for that matter, that is supposed to be one of the cornerstones of our democracy, is it not? It is supposed to be, but it's not, and it hasn't been for quite a long time. Um, the f f health advice, I mean, it's far from advice now. I mean, there's a case in Australia. Um, a young lady, 16 years old, um, refused her cancer treatment and was then ordered by a judge to resume it. Now, the details of the case um, are withheld because both the, the doctor and the patient are anonymized, but it is known that she was 16, she, uh, her parents agreed with her decision, and the the reason she did it is that a scan showed that her cancer had already gone, and she didn't want to continue because she considered they she considered it a miracle. But um, whether or not she's right, she has the right to say, "I do not want to carry on chemotherapy. I do want to carry on radiation." A judge cannot order her to do that, but they just have, and that is that is the kind of thing that this this French law will allow people in France to do as well. It's quite troubling enforce this is because again that's was a failure of the COVID narrative but people simply said i don't want the vaccine thanks i don't want it and too many people said that so next time be it COVID again or some other disease they're going to put laws in place that mean it's much harder to say no i don't want that thanks uh you know i find this uh, you know bewildering and terrifying at the same time i mean the right to bodily autonomy you know my body my choice whether it's to do with terminating a pregnancy or, frankly, any other uh, medication. I mean, I myself could take uh, medication which has been suggested for me uh, for a stomach condition, um, but I choose not to. And uh, to be fair to them, my GP here in the UK does not force me to take this medicine. I mean, <laughs> it starts getting into the realms of the ridiculous, whereby one can collect a prescription, say one's taking it and pour it down the toilet or something. Of course, that's very different with uh, injectables, with vaccinations, which are administered at a particular place by a professional. Although, of course, uh, hundreds of amateurs were enlisted for COVID with disastrous results. I think most of them had no idea what they were doing. Um, uh, whereupon, of course, you get a stamp, a QR code or whatever, proving that you have submitted to the will of the state and uh, taken this uh, medication, whatever it is. But uh, we're getting into some very deep and dark territory when it comes to the loss of bodily autonomy. I mean, along with freedom of speech, we're talking about some of the most fundamental human rights known to man which which are not in the gift of the state this is the important thing you know it's not yeah. up to, you know rights like that are not granted by the state you know only then to be taken away uh, and of course 
you know, the, it's claimed, Anne Whittacombe was claiming on um, this very station earlier today that uh, nobody was forced to take the vaccine in the UK. No, but mm. people in particular jobs, their lives were made extremely difficult if they didn't. I mean, in fact, you know, people were forced to resign. People, you know, lost their businesses or, you know, all sorts of things. So at one point, I mean, it's going back a bit now. People don't seem to remember the pressure was extremely heavy the vilification of uh, people who did not want to take part in the world's biggest ever medical experiment was absolutely off the charts of sort of collective hysteria was whipped up um and uh, as you say it, it seems that there were too many uh refuseniks i mean even that term, I'm not even comfortable with that term because that implies, you know, a refuse Nick implies somebody who is, um, you know, not willing to go along with something that's for the greater good. And as with all these things, it's the way that the narrative is framed by both the corporate media and government that seeks to demonize whole sections of society. It seems now with this new legislation in France, that that demonization is going to progress to criminalization potentially it's interesting what you said about um being able to pull a prescription down the sink if you want because back in 2020 or 2021 at the the davos um WEF summit i believe somebody suggested or even piloted technology implanted in um in pills that will be able to tell mean they can tell whether or not you've taken um so they wow. might actually address the pouring down the sink issue but you're um and what when they say no one was actually forced i mean that is a it's a specious argument no one was actually held down as far as we know they might have been in hospitals god knows what was going on in hospitals but coercion is a thing under law and everybody knows what it means if you say to somebody you have to take this vaccine or you're fired you force them to take the vaccine if you say you have to take this vaccine or we're docking your pay you're forcing them to take the vaccine that's a ridiculous argument and ironically of course coercive control is something that the state has now made a criminal offense within personal yeah. relationships uh, yet the state itself seems hell-bent on more and more coercive control we're going to take a short break with the network when we come back i want to hear more from kit about the other bees in his bonnet how are they rattling your cage kit we'll be right back after these messages tnt's mark morano breaking news climate punks trash the u.s constitution at the National Archive Rotunda in Washington, D.C. We are determined to foment a rebellion. We will not be held account to laws in which we have no voice or representation. The entire U.S. archive was evacuated because of this stunt. And did you notice our men in blue and women in blue stood around and enabled these protesters to not only deface the case of the, of the, where the U.S. Constitution was held, but also to quiet the crowd, it seemed like, and just allow them to speak. It's almost as if, hey, they have the floor, everyone. Let's be quiet. We have some, uh, we have some uh, vandals here that want to speak. Let's give them our due respect that they've deserved, that they've earned. Mark Morano on today's news talk. If you're talking about it, we're talking about it. Today's news talk radio, TNT. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to the Patrick Henningsen Show with me, Basil Valentine, in for Patrick. Today, Tuesday, the 27th of February, 2024. Well, the madness coming out of the mouths of these uh, army generals and ex-army generals and indeed our own uh, Minister of Defence seems to get worse and worse and worse. The latest is uh, another call for conscription, this time from... Uh, Sir Richard, where are we? Served as Deputy Chief of the Defence Staff and led joint forces before retiring in 2016. It's warned Brits to assume war is not always an away game. Uh, in other words, we have to get ready for the idea of conscription in the event of an attack by the Russians, believe it or not. Uh, this idiot seems to think that. Uh, 
the Russians are going to invade and uh, the young men of Britain are going to have to be forced into uniform uh, in order to fight off no longer the communist threat. Um, in fact, we never really seem to understand uh, why from the UK deep state, what possible motivation Vladimir Putin or anybody else running Russia could have for invading Western Europe, but that doesn't stop them talking the possibility up. Um, cyber attacks, uh, you name it. Uh, and that dreadful Macron has even started talking about sending French troops to fight in Ukraine. The drumbeats to war get ever louder. I'm given to understand that there was no talk of peace or diplomacy either in Munich last week or in Paris over the weekend. And now it seems our own Defence Secretary Grant Shapps. I mean, what an absolutely prime example of the intellectually and morally inadequate jerks that now populate the UK cabinet kit. And I gather that uh, Shapps in particular is now saying that there's going to be some sort of uh, attack on UK soil. What's the latest nonsense from Shapps? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, a couple of days ago, he reported or warned, as all the headlines put it, that we could face a Novichok style attack um, like the Salisbury poisoning in 2018. Um, a a sort of mass what... attack or something whereby, you know, uh, the I water think... supplies. I, I don't I, I don't think he meant anything like that sweeping and I don't think anything's going to happen. I don't I think he's just trying to drum up fear to address what you said about conscription. I actually don't believe they ever will bring conscription back. I think what conscription is, is a rhetorical trick whereby they put about, we're going to have to do conscription. And everybody says, we don't want to be conscripted. And they say, okay, well, if you don't want to be conscripted, we could do X instead. We could increase tax. We could increase funding for the military. We could buy these special drones or whatever. We could replace our Trident system for X trillion pounds. Then we don't have to do conscription. And then everybody goes, okay, we'll do that instead. That's a, a classic, like, set up and, and pay off thing for politicians. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the original Novichok style attack in 2018. Um, but it was, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not an expert, apart from the fact that the whole thing looked extremely dubious. I mean, apart from anything else, where are the victims now? Um, it really looked like one of these uh, staged events, to be perfectly honest, where uh, circumstances were created in order to present a particular narrative but the evidence for the crime in the first place was extreme, extremely sketchy. Uh, and, uh, and the aim of the uh, object, obviously, was to uh, add to the UK, uh, or rather drum up public support for the UK's demonization of Russia. Simple as that, really. Yeah, uh, in a nutshell, um, the, the circumstances of the original attack were bizarre. For one thing, they claimed it was Novichok. And um, that was a word that is now everywhere. And everybody understands it means a Russian poison. But that's not what it was originally. It was a nerve agent. And a nerve agent of, of such theoretical like lethality that the very idea that so far, absolutely everybody intentionally poisoned with it has been fine is, is absurd. It was supposed to be lethal in doses of five milligrams. And yet nobody has died except maybe Dawn Sturgis, right. who died by accident. But there's nothing to really connect her to Novichok. That was just something they said afterwards. Um, if, um, you had the bizarre um, timing. It was happened just after a chemical weapons drill in that area near Porton Down. The army's chief nurse was the first person on the scene who found the victims. And there were a DS a D notice put out on Pablo Miller, who was Screeple's um, intelligence handler when he was informed for MI6. The whole story was just a mess of nonsense. It never made any sense. It never made physical sense, as in it wasn't physically possible. So when he says we're going to have a Novichok style attack, <laughs> that's probably what he means. We're going to have some other event that never makes sense, doesn't hold up to any kind of scrutiny, and is plastered all over the headlines for some quite transparent agenda. Yes, uh, you know, public support for uh, Britain's role in the Middle East 
uh, and Britain's diplomatic position were not directly military involved, although, of course, we've supplied a lot of money and weapons to Ukraine. Public support for both those positions uh, is at an all-time low, and quite rightly so. People want to live in peace and prosperity, but it seems governments are intent on uh, fomenting wars, uh, vetoing ceasefires, continuing to supply. I mean, I don't know if you've done any work on the... Uh, UK planes, uh, aircraft that have been supplying the Israelis during the current genocide, the use of the bases in Cyprus, etc., which make uh, the UK directly complicit. Uh, Israel, of course, is due to present its uh, detailed uh, report as to how it's been protecting Palestinian civilians since the ICJ interim ruling uh, a few weeks ago. That's due in a few days now. Um, I've no idea what they're going to say, because I think something like three and a half thousand Palestinians have been murdered since then. Absolutely extraordinary number. Um, so, you know, uh, all this to me adds up to a sort of a crisis of legitimacy and authority in the body politic. And the only reaction that governments have to it is more and more authoritarian legislation. The only recourse that we as voters have, of course, is to vote people out of office. Uh, and uh, on that score, of course, uh, there's a small ray of hope in the personage of George Galloway, who I, you know, I don't agree with George on everything, but um, at least he's an anti-genocide candidate. I mean, it seems absolutely extraordinary that in 2024, uh, we are, <laughs> we're talking about candidates for the for the uh, House of Commons as to whether or not they are pro or anti-genocide. I mean, this is all in all. I mean, the, I hate to have to use the term, Kip, but, you know, the, <laughs> a lot of the conspiracy theorists 25 years ago were telling us we might end up in a place like this. Uh, well, it won't be the first time, it won't be the last that the quote-unquote conspiracy theorists were basically right about everything. Um, I mean, weirdly, although you say our the hope is in democracy, I'm I'm not sure that that's true. I, I I'm not sure if you saw this. It's quite interesting. The only intelligent thing Liz Truss has ever said happened earlier this week, when she was on a program with Steve Bannon, and she was she said, um, "The truth is that as a prime minister, I wasn't in control because prime ministers are elected, and when you meet the head of the Bank of England." and the, um, I forget who else she listed, those unelected people have far more power and influence than the elected officials do. And, and that, I'm not sure if she realized exactly how much of the game she was giving away. I'm not sure Liz Truss ever really realizes anything, but um, right, she's completely right. Yes, yes, she, she, she also said that they were referring to George Galloway, that there was a danger that uh, an extreme Islamist party would get a uh, a seat in the House of Commons, referring, of course, to the Workers' Party of Great Britain, uh, which has campaigned on all sorts of issues like returning the, restoring the maternity unit at Rochdale Hospital uh, and various local issues like that. Um, uh, and Galloway, of course, uh, is a staunch supporter of the Palestinian cause, but, you know, could in no way be described as an Islamist. But as you rightly say, it's very difficult to know what kind of relationship with reality Liz Truss indeed has. So, you know, Truss was, I mean, I think she actually also re referenced, correct me if I'm wrong, Kit, I think she actually also referenced the existence, I think she used the actual term, of the United Kingdom deep state. Uh, did she not say that? I think she did actually. Yes, there's a that's um, another interesting thing that was the that was the, the sole domain of conspiracy theorist talk until Donald Trump started talking about it in 2016. Um, as a proud conspiracy theorist myself, I never had a problem with it. Um, but then when well, Donald you know, Trump you know who first it, coined you you know who first coined the term, as far as I know. Um, I know. I'm not sure I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to put you on the spot or show off. I'm pretty sure it was Peter Dale Scott, the Canadian academic and researcher 
who wrote uh, several books on the uh, John Kennedy assassination, which was, I think, the first uh, a deep event he described that as, and subsequently mm. talk about talked about the uh, the deep state. He's well into his nineties now, Peter, um, and he's not a he's not a conspiracy theorist. Anything but uh, he's an academic, but an academic who strays off the reservation into subjects like. Uh, Kennedy, The American War Machine, in fact, one of his best books, is called simply That American War Machine. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Peter Dell Scott that first used the term, but it uh, hadn't previously crossed the Atlantic. But what people mean by it, and it, it's a very important and worthwhile term, in spite of, you know, pathetic attempts to denigrate it or claim that it's meaningless or, you know, doesn't exist mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, basically, it simply means the permanent government. Everybody is aware of the permanent government. I mean, if you look mm. at Washington, um, you, you would have thought that after the Iraq debacle, uh, the neocons all would have gone away with, with their tails between their legs um, and, and would have seen a sort of major shift in policy away from disastrous, extremely expensive and bloodthirsty foreign adventures but none of it because of course permanent washington which is this sort of unholy soup of think tanks uh defense contractors the state department the pentagon the department of defense the cia i mean the united states has effectively become a war economy it doesn't really produce any consumer goods anymore um it just borrows trillions of dollars in order to uh, supply weapons to its favorites, Ukraine and Israel, uh, money that's then recycled into the only thriving manufacturing part of the US economy, namely Raytheon, Lockheed Martin and the other weapons manufacturers. While uh, meanwhile, the population of the, of the big cities wander around on fentanyl like zombies and die by the thousand. I mean, the dystopia into which the United States has descended in the last 10 or 15 years is, to me, absolutely off the charts. And it's the deep state that is largely responsible for it, Kit. Yes, quite. Um, I would even take issue with calling Iraq a debacle. From, from their point of view, I would say Iraq was highly successful. Decade plus of war, a few casualties, but obviously they don't care about that. And just dropping bomb after bomb after bomb. You pay for the bomb, you blow it up, you buy another one. It's a pipeline of money to your friends. And as Orwell wrote about this in 1984, war is important in that sense, in that it destroys the products of society. You have factories that make things that you then deliberately destroy. So there is no progress, there is no building. Steel that goes into bombs is wasted. That is steel, it could be hospitals or it could be you know, art galleries, or it could be anything. It could be a yes. school. Instead, yes. it gets blown up. Yes. It's gone. Yes. It puts a cap on how far the bottom of society can flourish because it blows up out the products of our labour. Indeed, I remember from my economics degree that uh, government spending on weaponry, uh, on war, uh, has the least benefit to the overall economy of any aspect of government spending. If the government spends money on building roads, schools, hospitals, supporting the arts, the trickle, well, trickle down doesn't <laughs> exist. The multiplier effect, to use the Keynesian term, uh, is much more beneficial apart from being, you know, enhancing quality of life. But it seems that uh, quality of life uh, has become irrelevant to today's generation of politicians, Kit. And indeed, an attack on our quality of life is has been very much their stated aim for a few years. Like we have to get used to eating less meat or eating less sugar. We have to That's get used right. to uh, just the lower standard of living in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's become a it's become an aim in its own right, hasn't it? You know, and there was absolutely no need for it. As I'm fond of saying, there is no less money around than has ever been the case it is simply in fewer hands we now have a greater disparity in the distribution of wealth in the uk than we had in victorian times believe it or not you know and so and funnily enough 
I would say like they've gone from austerity to like the Green New Deal and stuff, which will be the same thing. It will be about impoverishing people. And I genuinely think there is a just a strangely competitive aspect to it. Imagine you are like immensely wealthy. You have billions upon billions upon billions. Your your reach and financially and powerfully are almost limitless. You can't really get any richer. So the only way to carry on winning the game is to make everybody else poorer. So you look richer in comparison. So like you have your hundred billion pounds and you spend a billion of it making sure that nobody else can ever eat meat. Only you can eat meat or only you can eat sugar or only you get to drive a car and that kind of thing. I honestly think there is a strange aspect to it of that kind. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, I, I go back as far as the 1970s. I can remember when the House of Commons had lots of trade unionists in it, had lots of genuinely working class people, including people like Harold Wilson himself, who was working class, but uh, went to Oxford, uh, a genuinely working class, not like that Starmer. Um, less said about him, the better. Um, and you had lots of people in Parliament who had done other things in their life before going into Parliament. We now have a House of Commons full of party apparatchiks, uh, yes men who climb this greasy pole from being a researcher to a secretary or back and forth, sometimes nipping out of active politics into a think tank and then re-emerging as a, a candidate, uh, invariably wet behind the ears. Uh, these days often, dare I say it, I think in many cases too young to have had uh, sufficient experience of the way the world works, uh, immature perspectives. Um, I could go on, Kit, but uh, if we can't do it through the ballot box, then, um, and we're going to rule out armed insurrection, how are we to improve our collective political, civil, and social life? I would say <laughs> it's a dumb question. I appreciate that. Um, I would say the model is there for as we as we discussed briefly earlier for the number of people that simply refuse to take the vaccine, for example, in the face of enormous pressure. That was a revolution of millions of people all making an individual decision. I think as individuals is the only way we win in the end. I think basically it's a person by person one at a time awakening project involving creating a passive resistance essentially yeah I, I i'm inclined to agree with you and I, one hopes that the sort of for want of a better expression upcoming generations um i'm in my late 50s shall we say um you know are if not immune stand outside the uh, brainwashing groupthink that affects the current generation of politicians. Put it that way, I, uh, at the risk of sounding like an old fogey, I do see some hope in younger people. Kit uh, Knightley, yeah. thank you. Go on. No, uh, that was all. I was just going to agree with you. Great. Kit Knightley, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Uh, please remind our viewers and listeners where they can find you. Um, they can find everything I write and everything Off Guardian publishes at off-guardian.org, and um, they can follow us on Twitter as well. At where are you on Twitter? At Off Guardian. At Off Guardian Zero. Actually, there's a, a long story at behind off. that, but <laughs> we'll have that another day. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on today's news talk today, Kit. No problem at all. Bye -bye. We're going to take a short. Thank you. Goodbye, kid. We're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, I will be joined by former Liberal Democrat MP and one of TNT's newest hosts, Lembit Opic, for his solution to Britain's political crisis. Don't go away. We'll be right back. <laughs> 